Gig Gab, episode 139 for Monday, November 6th, 2017. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm doing pretty good, man. Just back from a week of great vacation. My battery's charged and uh, ready to head into the holidays now. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, it's true. It's like, it's craziness from here on out for uh, for everything. But that's good. Did you Did you see any music while you were there? Yeah, I, I was in Hawaii. And, you know, the funny thing is I'm amazed that um, so many little restaurants have got these really, really competent, well, certainly slack key, you know, Hawaiian style music going on. But there's a lot of like really, really good, um, you know, like one or two person combos yep. using a lot of technology to sound like a full band in just about every lounge that's there. It's, really? you know, so there's a lot of live music. Yeah. And it's very polished there. You know, it, there's there's not. I mean, we were, we were sitting in pretty nice places, but even the restaurants we went to that were just kind of pubby things, Yeah, you know, they were really, you know, very, very good place. So I think the competition is probably pretty good over there. I mean, it's certainly, I don't know what the local homegrown music scene is there. Sure. Of course. Yeah. You were seeing the tourist focused music scene. Yeah. But it was Hawaiian. I mean, it was, it was, it wasn't all, it wasn't all like native people. It was, you know, it was what I'm assuming is transplanted people mm. playing Hawaiian music. So, but it's very high quality. And again, uh, you know, for the larger lounges in the hotels, it seems like uh, they're pretty sophisticated, you know, using you know, loopers and using modelers and using, you know, doublers and, you know, yep. back bands. And so it was actually, it was, it, but the musicians were very good. Huh? That's interesting. So, so, I mean, like everybody's using loopers. That's crazy. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Have you ever used a, a looper with your uh, like solo acoustic gigs and stuff? It's so funny. You ask. I just got one for my birthday. So my oh. birthday was a couple of weeks ago and yeah. my wife, my wife got me one, you know, the TC Helicon thing. And I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but I see that they're pretty common and uh, kind of like a lot of the discussions that we've had over the past couple of weeks. I consider myself kind of a purist, like a guy in a guitar yeah. try, trying to translate a song and, you know, communicate a song, tell a story. But I don't think it's smart in this day and age to be entirely, you know, blind to the technology sure. that's out there. That yeah, of course. Yeah. Huh. So I'm looking forward to digging in and, and seeing, you know, what I can do with one. It seems weird. The, the one that I got actually harmonizes my voice. So that seems weird to me, you know, to hear two voices when you don't see two voices. But I guess at the end of the day, it's no different than hearing a, a drum track when you don't see a drummer. Right. It's right. Just, it's you know, it's just a sound coming out. I, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that the ditto? Is that what is that the one you got or is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah OK. Yep. Oh, cool. I'm curious to see how that uh, how that works out for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it if you treat it like an effect and think about it like an effect as opposed to I'm trying to fool you. Right. <laughs> right. But it's just like, no, here's this other tool that I'm going to use. And then you use it uh, as you as it suits you, then hopefully that doesn't become something that, that people say, Oh, I hate that looper. You know, you know, it's like, Oh yeah. The way he uses it is cool. And I mean, it, I've seen people, I mean, I've seen people use an acoustic guitar in a way that's amazing. And I've also seen people use an acoustic guitar in a way that makes me never want to go see them use an acoustic guitar again. Right. Yeah. right you know, so it's the same thing with one of these is like, all right, how do you, how do you integrate it? How do you make it work? And you know, at the end of the day, it's still up to you to entertain. So. I will report back. I, you know, one of the nice things I have a much more reasonable schedule over the next couple of weeks. And so being able to play with some new toys, work on some new songs and, you know, see how things go. Yeah. So it'll be kind of a fun to kind of like stretch out a little bit. It, it, it's again, very foreign to me. I'm not terribly much of a gearhead. Like I, you know, my pedal boards are pretty simple. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, deep into the technology of, of different guitars and that type of thing. So, um, but I mean, I have a bit of a technical background and so, sure. you know, yeah, you, I, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> So we'll see. I'm looking forward to trying it and see what goes. And as long as it doesn't get in the way of telling a good story with a good song, you know, I think it'll be kind of fun. One of the guys I, I play with, uh, this guy, Matt Langley, who uh, plays guitar and chafed and then also does some acoustic gigs with us. In fact, I do more acoustic gigs with him than electric 
uh, these days, but he has uh, ver- gotten very much involved in using a looper and it's cause he's a great lead player. So he'll set, you know, set up the groove, like even while he's, and he's gotten so good with it, he'll be singing, you know, the verse of the tune or whatever, and he'll get that looping yeah. even while he's singing it. Like he'll just record that, you know, that, that loop and then just kick that off and play a solo over the verse that he just played and sang yeah. over. And it's great. Cause it really can stretch it out and make it a little more interesting. It's um, when I'm playing with him and I assume this is true for anybody that's playing with him, you know, sometimes that, that cut doesn't happen exactly where it needs to, right. You know, that, that, that changeover from, from live to loop. And, uh, and so that can be a little interesting trying to lock in a groove with something that's, that's repeating and perhaps not exactly right on, you know, every fourth time around or every eighth time around or whatever that works out to be. But, um, but, you know, you just I mean, I just know to listen for it and be like, OK, yep. Just like, you know, slide this one or rush this one slightly. Yeah. And, and you're right there. And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder that, that your focus gets to be more on the on the technology and remembering to click in a you know a patch and, or a loop and, and not on the song and emoting the song. So yeah, I wonder. That, that's not Matt's issue, but I can totally see where that where. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're not comfortable with it and it distracts you, then absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, I had um, the, the, it's a good segue into into the next thing I have here because we did a madhouse last week. And the goal for this one, like the last one, was to do it without any uh, any tracks and and without really any sequencing at all, because that worked really well for the last one. Unfortunately, at the last minute, we sort of and last minute, meaning maybe, you know, 48 to 72 hours out, we realized we really didn't have a lead guitar player. We had somebody that was willing to step in and play some rhythm guitar. I was like, okay, well that's going to change some things. And then we had a fiddle player that was going to play with us and she couldn't do it either. There was a, a uh, a big windstorm that blew through here and knocked people's power out. And she had to deal with, uh, you know, some things from that or whatever. So it was, it was basically a, a, a three piece. Well, it was a four piece band, but, but the guitar player was adequate for rhythm guitar only. Uh, and, and he did a great job. I mean, he's a keyboard player. So, you know, the fact that he was willing to step in and do this at all was, was awesome. But, uh, but it meant that we, we did a lot of things to tracks and we had no, uh, prior rehearsal. We rehearsed the afternoon of the gig. It was a Halloween night gig happened after the parade. I think I explained how that was going to work. And it was a one, you know, one set kind of 90 minute thing. And, uh, and it worked out really well. Um, having, a lot of the guitar in the tracks that we had to play along with actually made it easier to sniff my way through those tracks and be a little more natural with it. <laughs> well, a lot of times the track is there just to fill in like, you know, some weird instrument. And I don't mean weird, but non non core instrument, I should say, like it might be like, oh, yeah, there's a sitar solo or something. So we'll just have the track play that. But you got to keep in sync with the track all the way up to the sitar solo in order for that to come in at the right point and all that. Right, right, right. Right. Whereas having, you know, having it a lot of times, not for every track, but for a lot of them, having it be the guitar. It's like, oh, great. I just play like the guitar player knows the song the best. And wherever, you know, he takes it, even though it's just a computer, you know, I just follow that. And then and it made it really easy. We played um, we played a song by Disturbed uh, Down With The Sickness, which is this really heavy groove thing. And it's got a middle section that's basically, you know, seven, four versus three, four. It's a really weird thing. And I thought, how in the heck are we going <laughs> to? Like stay in sync with this because it's it's not I figured if we were playing it live, we'd just be able to we just sort of look at each other and maybe we wouldn't play it exactly right. But it's fine. You know, as long as we're all together, who cares? Um, but, you know, when I knew when I found out we were playing that one with the track, it was like, oh, and it was like <laughs> five guitars tracked. And it was this really thick, heavy kind of thing. But having the guitar be the thing that sort of led us through it, it was like totally fine. No problem at all. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so it went really well. It's interesting with these madhouses, man. The more rehearsal we put into them, uh, the it, it's like inversely proportional to how good they come out. That when we have like last minute rehearsals and that's all we have, they wind up 
uh, feeling the best to us. The audience is like them the best. It's crazy, but that's just, you know, I don't know that maybe that's, it's just, it's just the way this particular group of, uh, of artists works, I guess, <laughs> but it was fun. We, um, cool. yeah, we had it. There was an interesting thing that happened in the last one. Um, and it, it just goes, it's, it goes to show how important, uh, communication is. We got halfway through the last one we did was this Beatles one and we got halfway through, uh, the, the show, you know, there was an intermission and I left the stage cause I wasn't leaving the stage for anything. Cause it was, you know, there was no tracks. And so I played every song and I left the stage and went backstage and, and Brandon, the, the director and, and kind of the, the half of the team that sort of cooks these things up all the time. He's like, Oh, Hey, Hey, Hey. He's like, have we never had the conversation about how these are supposed to flow from like <laughs> one song to the other? I'm like, no, no. He's like, you know, I was sitting in the booth wondering why you were waiting to start songs. It's like, and I realized, he says, I tell the, like the, the dancers and the singers all the time when they're rehearsing, like separately, remember these things are just going to flow one into the other. So you just got to keep moving and keep everything. He says, but I realized you and I had never had that conversation. He's like, so now ah. I'm telling you, right? Yeah. He says, these are nice. meant to flow, flow that way. And I'm like, oh, sweet. So the second act of that one was like flawless, you know? So it was like, I don't, I'm not waiting for some signal that I don't know I'm waiting for, you right, know? Right. And, uh, and so for this one, of course, that broke some of the rules because we had some, some things where it didn't flow from song to song, but we knew to have that conversation ahead of time. And man, it made it so much less stressful because I, I charted it out in my, in my book. It was like, okay, great. From this song, start the next one from this song, wait to hear the click come in, you know, for this one. Nope. There's going to be some, you know, other thing on stage that happens. And then we start, you know, and uh, it's just one of those things. Like it's, you never want to assume, especially going into something that's, that's organized like that. It's just good to like over communicate that stuff. Cause we'd done what? seven or eight of these things before we finally had that conversation. Yeah. But I'm it, actually thinking about this cause we, um, we have this petty show coming up. Right. Yeah. And, um, so we did it once with one very brief rehearsal and then I've been gone for a couple of weeks and I'm gone next week. And, uh, the next one is next Sunday. And so, uh, I had a retrench. I, I did one of these, uh, you know, Dropbox now has this word processor called paper mm -hmm. Dropbox paper. Mm -hmm. So I, I set up a Dropbox paper document and I took all the songs that we did, plus the new ones. Each song, I included the YouTube link to the version of the song that we're doing. And then I put a couple of bullet notes of things to remember. So things that we missed in the first one. This is basically, um, it's like a, it's like an on paper rehearsal. Like here's, yeah. here's the stuff. And I wonder, um, to me, that makes sense. But I don't know if that makes sense to every, everybody, right? So, you know, there's things like, remember that four bar build in the middle before it goes into the, into the yeah. B section. Like right. That, right. Right. I, I would think that this is a good way to do it. And I'm about to find out, you know, again, I'm playing with a couple of guys. I know a couple of guys I don't know who I have made judgments about their work ethic, you know, to bring it together. That's why I invited them to play this with me. And so, um, you know, the first one was good, definitely needed, definitely some guys missed some things that were surprises to me that they would have missed those things. Right. Right. But I guess yeah, when everybody's yeah, sure. just learning, when you're learning without a rehearsal, your mind kind of goes to certain things. I mean, to me, form is the basic thing, right? You know, the, getting the right progression, the chords, you know, if, totally. if you're, and then form, because that's the thing that everybody is going to, you know, if you don't agree to that, that's where the train wrecks happen. That's right? Where, of course, that's where the train wrecks happen. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it's not all that different from what we're doing with these mad houses. Cause it's like, okay, yeah, we have the chords, but the form, like this is important, especially when those four people organized like a tap dance to the form that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we can't fake it. Like it's gotta be right in. Otherwise it doesn't, you know, it doesn't pop. Yeah. So g give me a little help here because I'm, one of the guys is, who I have not played much with is our drummer. Yeah. And, and I think I'm a good leader and I think I know what I'm doing when I'm trying to lead a guy through a song, you know, I'll call out, you know, one more time if I want a, a, a rephrase to uh, a refrain sure. to repeat one more time. What are the things as a drummer, when you're brought in cold, what are the best things a leader can do to help you? Like, you know, it, it, like, have you ever been tentative in the middle of a song? Like some, your spidey sense is tingling, you know, something is not sounding the way I thought it to do. And you're like waiting for somebody to clarify it. Yep. Or do you put your head down and plow through? What are the best things a leader can do to help a drummer 
um, continue on through things. And one of the best things you can say to drummers who are sitting in, you know, kind of cold on yeah. something, this, this type of situation. I mean, you know, the worst thing is if a drummer stops in the middle of a song, he gets, can't kind do of, that. Right. Can't, you can't get paralyzed by fear that things are not going the way you thought it would be. Right. Keep laying it down until somebody tells you not to. But what are the other things that a leader can do to guide a drummer through endings? How to, how to best, you know, like I always raise my guitar neck up and bring it down in time. You know, those are the things follow me on endings. Tell me from a drummer's perspective, what are the best things you can do to get dragged to a gig? Yeah. So, um, the, there are several and I've, I've had to communicate this because it's, you know, like, like we were just saying the over communication is what reduces stress and also reduces train wrecks. So the, the first thing is, are there any breaks in the middle of the song? Like that's the first question I'm going to ask if I'm playing a tune cold, right? Are there any breaks or do we play? And then at the end we all stop together and, and then that leads into, okay, how does the song end? Do we all end together or is there a thing? And I want to know also, is there a spot in the tune where you stop, but I don't, mm. right? Because that's where it gets weird. If I hear a guitar, if I hear the entire band stop, uh, it, let's say it's the first time I'm ever playing Taking Care of Business, right? I mean, I already know the song. I think probably everybody <laughs> listening knows the song, which is why I, I use that as the example. Right. There's that middle section, actually two of them, where everything stops and the drum groove keeps going and the drum groove keeps going confidently. Uh, I need to know as a drummer, like, should I like when I hear you stop, that should not surprise me. Right. <laughs> right? Like, oh, crap. Is the song over? I, I like I need to know that. And then does everybody come in together and. Uh, it, it, sort of the follow up to that is, does everybody need to come in together? If I don't know the tune, it's really hard for me to define the tempo, right? Because I'm just pulling it out of thin air. Um, it and, and even if somebody else counts it in, if they're not used to counting in tunes, they're almost always going to count it in at the wrong tempo. Because in order to count in a tune the right way, you have to kind of stop. You have to think you have to feel it and then you can count it in. And if somebody's not used to counting in tunes, if somebody like, let's say you got a sub drummer or something and your main drummer is the one that always counts them in. And now it's up to the band leader to count them in. The band leader's not used to doing that. He or she's not going to do it effectively in most cases. Right. So, right. Right. So it's like, OK, hey, can we not have you count this in, but can we just have you start the song? Like if it you know, if it's a petty tune or something like uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, well, American girl's a bad example. Cause it does start with the guitar, but like last dance with Mary Jane, right? Like you could play through that, even though everybody comes in together, you could play through that form once and then have the band come in. Actually, that does start on a guitar riff. So, oh, you, so you have okay. To, yep. Yeah. So, so the guitar player sets the, sets the tempo, sets the that. tempo. Right. But that's kind of the thing is even if it's a tune where everybody comes in on the, you know, on, on the downbeat of one, like maybe just play through the form once and then we all come in. And that way I'm not wondering, is the tempo right? And also I'm not getting this, oh, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. Because that that's a really difficult thing to do um, when you've got a band moving to speed up or slow down to something that to it to a moving target. Right. If I don't know the song and you say speed up. It's like, well, how, by how much, <laughs> like, mm. right. You, you know, like I don't, yeah. I don't know. And, or slow down. Well, by how much, I mean, I can turn this into molasses. I don't know that that's what you want or maybe it is. So, yeah. So those kinds of communicate like that's, and that all, I mean, we just talked through it here, but that can happen in, you know, in 15 seconds. Like, are there any breaks? Who starts it? How do we end? And boom, you know, yeah. off you go. Yeah. I, 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 you can't be. You have to be a good listener, right? You, oh, you know, yeah. When you're when you're sitting on a gig, you cannot get dis you cannot disappear into your grooves Ooh. unless you know you're going to be left alone for a little while, right? And mm -hmm. even at that, it's probably risky. It, you know, yeah. you are. Yeah, yeah. You're a side man, right? So I do things like you know when I want when I want you know a passage to be played quieter. I'll just say it. I'm I'm. Yeah, I'm there's amused. nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, but I'm amused by how much that still takes some players by. Cause I don't think a lot of leaders do that or maybe a lot. I don't know, but um, I'm amused at how it seems like a very clear communication to me. And, you know, when I play with musicians that I, that I'm not familiar with, like, you know, if I'm leading something or I put together a, a, sure. a put together band, you know, that's one of the things that to me is someone that I can play with someone who's a really good listener and they can, you know, take dynamic cues as well as, you know, like sometimes, 
you know, I'm not expecting people to read my mind, but I do expect people to listen. And so like, if I want to build to go on a little bit longer, or if I know that there's a passage in the middle, right. Where, where, you know, the first two times through it's a two bar phrase. And the last time through it's a four bar phrase. I will try and get eye contact, hold my guitar neck up and yep. count and just try and get someone to like lock in on me and try and guide them through a section. Yep. And that's, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the, I think the band leader's responsibility, right. Is to like, you know, what are the areas that are probably yeah, going to some, give somebody's got to be the band. music director. Right. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but it, it requires good listening and it requires, uh, you know, a, a common understanding. And then one time through a gig, after you realize what guys do know how to interpret and do not know how to interpret, that's why I'm kind of excited about the second time around yeah. is we've done it once and it was a good B. And I think it can be a B plus or an A, you know, if the guys, like I said, read the, the, Dropbox paper doc that I created and, um, you know, focus on those things and, uh, and just listen and keep your eyes wide open, but don't, don't yeah, just it, a, a, a B for the first gig can turn into either. I, I don't think you've got B plus on the charts. I think you've got like an, an a minus or maybe even a solid a or a solid C. Yeah. If you took it too easy, like we got this and you don't, yep. you don't think about it again and you don't brush over the stuff yep. that was a little, that was a little messy. And so I've been kind of that guy though. I've been sending a lot of emails. Hey, making sure you're catching this here. Here's a couple notes and, you know, trying to, you know, and sending it to the whole group. So we're not singling out anybody. Of course. You yeah. know, and, uh, you know, there was one uh, key change that one of this guy who's going to sing one of those songs. So that was a reason to send out an email. So of the three weeks since I've announced the gig until we play the gig, you know, I've, I've created the Doc, checked in with everybody. You have any questions? It's all on you. I know my guys in the House Rockers. We do this with the House Rockers stuff, right? Right. They, but you've this been, is our job. you've evolved that over time. That's right. We've yeah. evolved it. They know my expectations. I yeah. know their capacity. I know how to read between the lines when I know that they're busy and they're probably not getting everything. So there's a whole little dance there. Mm -hmm. But that's 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 a known. It's the unknown guys that I try to like. You know, here's what I expect, and here's you know what it is. Because you know, at the end of the day, my name's on this gig, right? And I'm selling tickets to this gig sure. with my name on this gig. And so you know, I think everyone will be a pro about it, and uh, I'm anticipating it'll be cool. You know, I've got some guest singers, and you know, again, they're they're proven quantities on this thing, so I that's think awesome. it'll be fine. Yeah. So, um, you know, how to do a gig with no rehearsals is kind of the, is kind of the. <laughs> so I'm curious, um, to dig in a little bit, like your, your Dropbox paper thing that you're doing, you're actually, it, it, you're not just using, you're starting with charts, but you're actually making your notes collectively on the, on those charts, as opposed to you making notes on, on yours and somebody else making notes on, on his or hers. You've got like a master set of charts where you're, you're adding in these extra things. Is that, is that right? It's not charts. It's just okay. a link to a, it's just a link to a YouTube doc, which is like, this is the, this is the form and version of the song that we're doing. Got right? it. Okay. And I always, you know, like we've had this conversation. I use live music because sometimes you can hear the parts better than overproduced. Like to I think we're totally, like, you know, but do you, but do you have, but I mean, is there, is there a, like a, a chart, like a lead sheet where you've got like the lyrics and the chords over it? Like you might find it at, I don't know, ultimate guitar.com or, you know, chords, a Y Z or what, I don't know any nope. of those places. Just the YouTube doc. Huh? Yeah. See, I, I think, I think charts would help you immensely here because that way uh, we do charts for all the fling tunes, the madhouse stuff um, to a greater and lesser degree is, is charted. Like being able as the drummer, even though I'm not playing chords, being able to hear not only the lyrics and see them on a chart in front of me, but also hear when the chord changes happen. It's like, OK, I like I can understand a song way better and I can also predict it. Like if I look and I see that the chorus has the same changes as the verse or this section that's not labeled has the same changes as the verse. It's like, Oh, I bet that I should play that kind of like a verse, you know, whereas, okay, this is the chorus. Oh yeah. Okay. I, like let's, even though it's the same changes, it's a chorus. Let's open it up to the ride symbol or something and, and add a little more life and energy here and then bring it back down for the, for the thing. But if I don't know a tune being able to see that the chorus has, you know, two more lines left in it of lyrics, I know not to play a fill out of that until I get to that point. So putting in the time to build those kinds of charts uh, would make, I bet would make a huge difference for, for projects like this for you. I think, well, I don't know if well, for me, so there, again, I have I'll well, always for the people that you have playing with you. Well, that, well, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. so 
I have a couple of guys that I, I will usually use in a project like this that I, they're known quantities. I know how yep. they prepare. And so that's good. Uh, I don't know if the other people do charts or read charts, mm-hmm. you know, so even if it's just as simple as a lyric chart and actually it's an interesting discussion, lead, lead sheets mean different things to different people, right? Yes. You said like an ultimate guitar thing. Yeah. Some people want sheet music, right? You know, right. more, more drummers would want sheet music, right? Like I've had drummers who sit, who've sat in with the house rockers and they're like, just give me the, give me the lead trumpet chart and I'll, I'll be fine. Yeah. Right. right. So that can work, especially for the type of stuff you do with the, with the house rockers. But for like a straight ahead rock gig, like this, this petty stuff, I would want, you know, like we used to do for the all-star band. Uh, so let me tell you why, let me tell you why I'd, I I would rather not do that. Yeah. There's going to be goofs. Of course. And, and a, it's better if someone is just familiar, you know, familiar with the song enough, not, not to a lead sheet, not like relying on a lead sheet, uh-huh. but familiar like that, that they're using their ears instead of their eyes. And so if the goof is going to happen, you know, uh, you know, usually it's the leader or the singer that they're going to a chorus early or doing something like that. But if you're following, if you know the song well enough and you follow and you let your ears decide, you know, what you're doing as opposed to what's on the paper, I would find if you're locked to the paper, like I, I have one friend who's no, a drummer, no, 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 no. who's a great drummer, a great drummer, but he is locked in on his charts hmm. and he doesn't hear around him when something isn't going to the chart. Got and it. it's, you know, you got to get his attention and then, then he's totally now, now where do I go on the chart now that something has changed? Right. So that I, I'm going to say that's his problem, but really, because it, it, because I, I totally disagree with your, I, your assessment is based on people like that. And, and that to me is, is the problem, not the chart. It like for me having the chart there, if you get like, if, if the song goes off the rails, it doesn't matter who gets lost. Right. It, it like once the song's into train wreck territory, the only important thing is who's going to lead out of it. Right. doesn't matter how you got there. And so if I hear somebody starting to sing something, I can quickly look at the, the chart and be like, oh, that's a chorus. Great. If I'm playing a chordal instrument, great. Now I know what chords you're playing because I hear you singing the chorus and I can jump to that. So you, you have to have big ears. And it sounds like this drummer you're talking about might not have the biggest ears. Great, you know, great ability to follow a chart. But if he's not listening around him, th- that's not going to matter anyway, whether he's got a chart in front of him or not. You know, so well, like I said, so, so the two biggest things that I notice are we we got together to run this in a rehearsal one time, a bunch of verbal things, you know, that at the time sure. were agreements to how we should end the song. And then once you get live, they uh, many of them seem to go out the out the window, yeah. right? Because it's yeah. just not enough. It's not uh, enough repetition. It's not enough, right? right? You you can't remember it, which is why I like charts because I can always <laughs> write on it. Well, like in the blues band I played in, we had two. When I joined the band, they're like, "Look, we got two endings." They're like, "We have Montgomery Ward and Sears and Roebuck," and Montgomery <laughs> Ward is just like Montgomery. Ward, right? So it's just this big, you know, 5 1 kind of ending thing. And then Sears and Roebuck is, da, da, um, dun, dun, ba, do, ba, you know, it's like, great, perfect. So they can call out in the middle of the last chorus, Sears and Roebuck, and I know exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. <laughs> but, but if I, but, and to this day, I'll write those like on, uh, on a uh, on a chart, like if ending colon Sears and I like I'm good to go. But but like I don't necessarily like when we're doing like these madhouses. I mean, there, there were whatever, 20 songs that we played the other night. And there's no way that I could listen to them enough in the week before to intuit my way through them. Having the chart is super helpful because I can hear where the, the, the singer is, especially if the singer gets lost. It's like, okay, nope, just keep going around. It's fine. Like just follow the leader. And, you know, by using the chart, you know where the leader is likely to go next. But, it, but again, you can't just blindly follow the chart. You've got to use it as, as, as a tool. Right. And and apply what you're hearing to what you're seeing there and be like, oh, OK, I guess we're going to do that verse twice. That's cool. You know, no problem. I, at least I know where we are. So I don't know. I think charts are a really good thing. I, I mean, I, obviously, charts are a basic tool. I'm, I'm curious, though, when you say, oh, I guess we're going to do that that verse twice. I say, OK, he's making an interesting decision. What other interesting decisions is he going to make? Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. you you know, like it seems That's like correct. when things go. Yeah. When things go off the rails, they go off the rails. Right. But at least now I know, OK, we're off the rails. Great. Like if I don't know the song well enough, I might not know we're off the rails. 
Hmm. Yeah. No, well, charts are good. But, yeah, but I, you don't, I don't I don't I don't I don't doubt yeah. charts are good. I just expect people to chart for themselves and to chart accurately. Oh, well, that's yeah, that sure. I, I, absolutely. I, I do a lot of my own charting for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, you got to have. Well, that's why I was curious about this, because, it, you know, like I'm happy to let people see my charts, but you might not like they might be totally like when you ask me for charts for, you know, uh, for all the stuff that I built for the house rockers. It's like, yeah, man, but like this is this is Dave speak. Like, I don't yeah. I like there's no answer key to what this means. <laughs> Sears and Roebuck. <laughs> Sears and Roebuck. Like, what the hell is that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, hey, <laughs> uh, you know, I know. Anyway, 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 shall we go on or have we hit enough for today? Yeah. We have any questions? We do. We had listener David on uh, on Twitter actually asked us a little while back. He said, I know uh, and I'm paraphrasing his question because we don't have the, the question in front of us. But the question was basically, what earplugs should I use? Uh, he was asking about both on stage and then also seeing, you know, going to see live bands or, or whatever. And I, and I will say. Great question. Because protecting your hearing is one of those things that can pay huge dividends down the road. I, um, I you know, I, I got crazy about this when I was a kid. I read an uh, interview with Alex Van Halen when I was like 14 or 15, right when I started playing the drums. And he said uh, that he had lost like 60% in one ear and 30% in the other. And I thought, man, no, like not me. And I started wearing earplugs. And it sucked at first because it sounds different. It doesn't matter how great your earplugs are. It's different than not earplugs, right? Mm. But um, the other day, my, I was playing around and there's this, uh, this tone for, the, uh, like for smartphones that was actually created to annoy kids. And then kids started using it as their ringer and message tone. And it was created to annoy kids because it's generally below the range that uh, anybody over about 25 or 30 can hear. It's at 17.4 kilohertz. And so I found the tone and I played it. I can still hear it totally fine uh, at, you know, the ripe old age of uh, 40, whatever, 46, I guess. All right. <laughs> so, something like that. Anyway. Uh, but, you know, like any everybody else my age is like, I can't hear that. They're like, how do you hear it? You're a drummer. You're a musician. Like, well, I protected my ears. So. Uh, with that in mind, you, you, you're probably not going to get hearing back, although some people have said they have once they started really protecting their ears and, and kind of paying more attention. But uh, you can certainly stop the damage. So there's quite a few, uh, uh, you know, I'll start by saying you can go all the way to the high end with earplugs and get what are called musicians earplugs. Those are custom fit uh you generally go to an audiologist, have them pour the goop in your ears, and then that's sent off to a company like Etymotic or or Futurisonics or, or any one of the, there's quite a few that'll make what are called musicians earplugs, and uh, and they're but they're not cheap. You know, you you're spending about 150 bucks for the earplugs, maybe 110 plus another you know 50 ish to your audiologist for the molds and that sort of thing. So that's that's a big investment. Uh, thankfully, technology has come around such that you can get that something that approximates that sound quality in a, what I call a universal or do it at home fit. So, uh, so there's a couple that I recommend. Uh, the first that I'll start with is decibels, D E C I B U L L Z. Uh, this is a custom fit, do it at home set of earplugs. You do it for 25 bucks. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, you, you, you get this, uh, it's this material and you heat it up in water and then you kind of, once it's, once it's sort of malleable in the water, uh, hot water, uh, you, you sort of roll it in your hands and, and get it mushy and then you sort of pack it into your ear and it cools and forms to your ear with this earplug filter in it. And the trick is having a, a filter in there, which there, there's comes with that doesn't just block out all sound because then everything sounds kind of like muddy and, and awful. Uh, you want a filter in there that, that blocks out the sound levels equally. So it basically sounds like you've turned down the volume and, uh, and the decibels, the filter's not bad. And, uh, and obviously you can put it right in your ear and, and make this custom fit for yourself. And you can even put other filters in there thing too. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So, so that's, 
That's the first. Have you ever tried those, Paul? The decibels? I haven't. And actually think I should. You know, I'm, I think I've been pretty lucky with my hearing. I can't I can't quite tell. And I probably should get a hearing test. I've done I've used those in ears on and off like we've talked about. Sure. in gigs, And so I'm sure that's been helpful. But largely I don't. And I certainly listen to headphone music and and, you know, like off my my phone or my or my iPod fairly loud. Yeah. You know, pretty much pegged. Really? Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's um, that you know that that's and that's also the issue with in ear monitors too is you know they can save your hearing if they're lower than what you would otherwise be hearing on stage, right? Right. Yep. Right. 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 Um, so those are the decibels. Uh, Ed Emotic, who I, I mentioned earlier, who makes the uh, the the musicians earplugs, they've been making what there, there's a line of earplugs that they've made for years called the ER twenties. Um, the sizing on them has changed. They, but, but it's all still basically the same thing. 20 bucks. It's a triple flanged piece of rubber that kind of goes into each ear with a filter on the end. Their filters are fantastic. And again, for 20 bucks, you've got earplugs that probably are going to be very comfortable, very discreet, and really are like turning the volume down. I, I was ready to go and get my wife some custom fit earplugs years ago because we go to a lot of concerts and stuff. And she's like, I just want it to sound good, but I don't want to hurt my hearing. And I was ready to do it. And then and then stumbled on these. And she's like, oh, this is awesome. And and she's right They're You know, they're great. Uh, cool. Yep. So that's the uh, the etymotics. The 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 next thing that I have on my list that I've tried recently that I've been experimenting with is similar similar in design to the etymotics are ear guard e e a r g a r d mm -hmm. and uh, they're 20 bucks and then these new ear plugs uh that are also 20 bucks very similar uh they come with a different sort of case and stuff but it's very similar to what etymotic does and then um possibly my my current favorites are from a company called dubs d u b s at getdubs.com these are, uh, again, similar thought process with a good filter and all that stuff. And they're, I'm trying to think of how much the dubs are. I've got it in front of me. Bear with me. Oh, they're 20 bucks. Yeah. Okay. So I'll put a link to those. Uh, basically, it, the, the filter is sort of built into the earplug with these. It's not, it's not replaceable, but they really are discreet, fall kind of flat in the ear and, and do a great job of just turning the volume down. So cool. I'll put links to all those in the show notes, but but yeah, like you said, Paul, it's it's not it's not a bad idea to have them. I wear them. I wear earplugs religiously at concerts, and um, and it's nice to be able to walk out of a show and not have any ringing. In ringing, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because that's when you know, like, oh, the ringing means bad things. And look, I don't, I don't want to sit here and say that I don't have any hearing damage. I definitely do. I they're like at about six k. I've got some ringing in my ears, I think from being next to an open back Fender twin in that blues band for, for years and years. But, um, but you know, you do what you can, you got to protect as best you can. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. Cool. I've always said, I don't want to lose any of my senses, but if I, if I had to pick and I got to pick hearing would, uh, would be at the end of the list for, for me <laughs> to lose, I, you know, I mean, again, I, you know, it's I like your, it's your biggest tool. Yeah. It's the thing that brings me the greatest pleasure in, in life. So yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Good question then. Yeah. Good question. Thanks. And you can always find us. You can find us on Twitter, gig gab podcast. You can find us on uh, Facebook. If you go to gig gab podcast.com slash Facebook, that'll bring you right to our group there. And of course, giggabpodcast.com as well, where you can, uh, you can see the shows and then feedback at Giggab Podcast, where you can contact us. Anything else, Paul, or are we good to go? I think it's good today. All right, man. Well, that's how it goes. Bring the band in and we'll get out. Always be protecting your hearing. Always be protecting your hearing, whether you're performing or not. But always be performing. Always be performing. 